So welcome to this Travel Weekly webcast. I'm Ian Taylor and I'm joined by Mark Tanzer, Chief Executive of APTA, who's here to talk about the um, Global Travel Task Force report. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Ian. Um, would it be right to say you're not satisfied with the task force report? There's a lot uh, missing, I would say, from the report in terms of uh, detail about the application of it and timings. And, uh, and clearly there's a lot of work that still needs to be done to get ready for what the task force is aiming to achieve, which is the safe restart of international travel. So uh, there are some sort of positives in, in the framework, I would say, uh, but um, I guess frustrated and, uh, and anxious that you know, it needs to increase its pace to get us in a position where we can actually uh, get moving. Okay, and am I right in thinking that not much will happen this week because of the death of the Duke of Edinburgh? Well, I think that, you know, a very sad event obviously uh, overtook everything last week, uh, but, you know, the officials are still working, the department's are still there, and we're hoping we can uh, work with them to press on. Okay, the green list of, of countries initially is going to be pretty short, isn't it? We don't know. That's one of the frustrations. Uh, you know, the government has given very general guidance as to the uh, parameters that will go into deciding which country is in which category. So it talks about the vaccine, vaccination levels, the uh, presence of, of variants uh, and so forth. But there is no guidance as to how high those thresholds will be set or which countries will, will come into that category. So we've no way of knowing at this stage how many category, how countries will be in category uh, green and amber and red. And you know what we say, you know, said to the minister is, uh, you know, waiting until the day before May the seventeenth, telling us means that travel won't really start on May the seventeenth. You know, the sooner we can get an indication of that, the better. And um, you know, I understand the government is trying to balance, uh, you know, giving early advice against the risk that the advice may change. But you know, we're really pushing them for an early statement of which countries are, are going to be open on the on the seventeenth of May. Well, the government said it will it will give more detail early in May, doesn't specify when, there's a suggestion it could be a week before May the 17th. It, will that be enough notice? Well, the more notice, the better. I think, you know, government definitions of early May can be anything up to the middle of May. And, uh, you know, a, a day really counts in this, in terms of not just the industries getting ready, but customers' confidence to book. And, um, you know, we've also, and I've been saying to the government that having gone right through, uh, you know, the whole Easter period with travel, international travel is still illegal. You know, the summer season is even more important than ever, and a day lost is, is uh, crucial, let alone a week. Um, so keeping up the pressure, we and the other industry bodies, to really get an early statement of which countries are, are going to be open. Okay. The, the amber list is pretty much what we have now for all non-red list uh, countries. Is that disappointing? pointing or is it pretty much what you expected and the important thing is the green list? I think it is disappointing Ian. I think you know the the amber list um, still looks very uh, how can I put it severe in terms of the 10-day quarantine in particular. Um, I think if uh, if you've got test to release after day five then can we bring that back in line because it's quite messy at the moment with you know day two day eight tests but then a test release at day five so you know, could that be shortened uh, is, is something we've asked the government to look at. And I think particularly for short trips and business trips, um, you know, Amber effectively is, a, is a prohibition on it because it just doesn't fit people's travel schedules. And I think the step up from green to Amber is very, very big now. And people will be very hesitant to, um, to book if they think something's on the green watch list because Amber is so severe. So I think, um, you know, as we move forward, I know there are other review dates that have been mentioned, June the 28th, July, October. Um, the sooner we can, we can really focus on, on the amber category and make that more accessible, taking into account the risk, the better. The, you've criticised the, the cost of testing. Well, everybody's criticised the, the cost of, of testing. The government appears ready to try and drive down the, the, the cost of PCR our tests. Uh, is that the limit of what you can hope for at the moment? Well, we would like to see for the green category, uh, you know, the requirement for a PCR test uh, abolished and replaced initially with a 
you know, a lateral flow test with a cheaper test. And ideally, you know, to go to a position where we've got unrestricted travel, where you don't need tests because we're confident that either through our own vaccination levels and the risk in country, um, tests are, uh, you know, over, you know, over, over, I don't know, over secure measure. Um, but in the meantime, uh, trying to get lateral flow in for the green countries is, is part of our focus. I think the government is also looking at whether or not for the pre-departure tests, these are the tests that you're required to take before you re-enter the country, um, that could be a lateral flow test so that uh, you know, people could take out with them a lateral flow test that's free from, from the government website and use that um, for their return test. So that would, that would help rather than buying a test in destination. Uh, but you're right, the overall cost of testing is still um, very high for PCR tests. It seems to be, from our research, twice what it is on the continent. And, uh, and the government, I think, needs to look at how it's going to work with its government approved suppliers. Because, don't forget, you know, at the moment, you have to have your PCR test through a government approved supplier so they can verify that it's been taken. To, um, to put pressure on them to bring the costs down uh, as, as a quid pro quo for being on that approval list. Yeah, that seems a, a clear mechanism for them reducing the the cost, threatening to take providers off the list. But given that the government has made clear this is the PCR testing is about spotting variants of, of concern, do you think it's realistic to get uh, PCR tests removed altogether? But my understanding is that the, the task force was going to introduce a requirement for two PCR tests and that it is is that was the demand of de the Department of Health and Public Health England, and it's accepted that that would be wholly o onerous and therefore, you know, is allowing one of the tests to be uh, a, a rapid test. Do you think that's the most we can hope for, at least in the initial phase? I think, yeah, I think the government set out what, what is going to be the initial requirement, and that I think is going to be in place until certainly it's reviewed on June the 28th. And... Um, you know, the, the priority the government has is uh, you know, not to go backwards in the progress we've made in, in getting, uh, you know, uh, infection levels down, but also vaccination levels up. Um, you know, the medical knowledge is moving uh, in parallel to this. So understanding how effective uh, vaccines are against these variants uh, is really important. And ultimately, getting that risk and, and, and reward position right. Um, you know, if you really, really wanted to stop any variant of uh, COVID ever entering the country, you wouldn't have international travel, uh, but there'd be a huge kind of social and economic cost to that. So understanding what that balancing point is, is the government's task, and it may change as we move into the summer. But, you know, we're very determined to keep them focused on, on the costs of, of over, you know, over strict rules. Uh, regarding testing. Okay, the, the reviews do give hope, the review dates, the checkpoint dates of a wider opening, don't they, and a relaxation. And the dates themselves are interesting, aren't they? June the 28th, July the 31st, October the 1st. How do you interpret those? Well, I think as with the domestic lockdown, they seem to be setting a sort of five-week kind of parameter for enough data to come in to justify uh, the uh, decision to change and to give people notification of that. So although those aren't exactly five week schedules, they're all sort of in the same pattern as, um, as the domestic changes or the domestic review points. Um, and I guess, you know, with the, um, you know, the number of destinations, they're going to be reviewing a vast amount of data and the joint biosecurity Center is going to be um, analysing that, so it's going to take a while before they have the confidence to move something, uh, certainly to a, a less risky category and potentially to a more risky category as well. Okay, but the, the June the twenty eighth day in particular suggests that the that the government will look at it with a view to potentially uh, relaxing things in time for the school holidays. I hope so. Yeah, the. Um, you know, every, as I said earlier, every day counts here and, uh, you know, every week counts. So, um, you know, the government's, I think, been made very aware of, of how critical uh, that peak season is with the school holidays, more so than ever when you've effectively missed a whole year of, of, of travel. And um, so I think, uh, you know, keeping them focused, keeping to that review date and getting the uh, whatever comes out of that implemented as soon as possible is, is what we'll be pushing for.
Okay, you've, you've urged the government to consider exemption for the vaccinated. That is in the report, uh, isn't it? Uh, but it's also the subject of a, the separate COVID status certification review. How, how soon do you expect to see um, vaccination certific certification and, and COVID status certification being part of the travel process? Well, I think the government's aware that it is an indispensable uh, element for international travel, partly because other countries are wanting to see it. Uh, and, you know, I hope that, um, you know, work to get a, a digital um, certificate available is, is, is going to produce results as soon after May the 17th as possible. Now, it could be that in the meantime, uh, if it, there is a delay from a technology point of view or a regulatory point of view that you need a um, sort of paper-based version and there will always be people who haven't got a, you know, a smartphone or a digital app. So how is that going to work alongside any digital certificate is something I know the task force has, has raised and is, is being addressed. Um, but it, it is essential that uh, we have that uh, to, to enable people to get um, entry into other countries. Do, realistically, do you, is it feasible, would you say, to have certification available digitally in time for the summer peak, in, assuming there is some sort of uh, summer peak, peak? I hope so, Ian. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not um, you know, a technologist uh, in terms of how quickly you can develop the underlying kind of information system to support that. I think there, um, you know, there are various obstacles that had to be overcome. One was a political obstacle. You know, that there was a, you know, initially a resistance to having any kind of uh, certificate about vaccine. I think we've moved through that. Um, there's then the <clears throat> the kind of where is the information? Uh, you know, the NHS uh, vaccine app is there. Uh, you know, the, that can that be used? How do you protect people's data? Who has access to the data? So there are a lot of different pieces that have to come into play for this to become a, a part of the you know, sort of daily travel picture. Um, but that's what, you know, the task force raised this five weeks ago. And, um, you know, we are, we are urging uh, the government to work with private sector suppliers. There are people out there who can, who can help facilitate this uh, to uh, get something in place as quickly as possible. Okay. The, what about the devolved administrations? The, the report says that the, the government will seek to align the um, requirements and, and so on, but we've seen differences continually all through the, the, the pandemic. So how hopeful are you that restrictions will, and requirements will be aligned across the, the, the four administrations? Well, I am hopeful. Obviously, you know, the domestic uh, control is, is a devolved uh, responsibility and I completely understand how different parts uh, of those will, will have taken different views. But international travel is requires some kind of international standardisation, otherwise it, it becomes very disruptive and people have to move from one place to another in order to fly in or fly out. So um, I think, uh, you know, coordination at the, uh, the UK level is uh, welcome uh, and important and I hope uh, that that's what we'll get. OK, but specifically the Scottish administration has taken a much tougher line at the border, hasn't it, consistently than, than the UK government for, for, for England. And there may be political reasons for, for, for that as much as health. So really, is it, is it realistic to expect uh, an alignment? Well, it's, you know, it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, otherwise you might end up with people driving from Scotland to Newcastle to fly internationally and flying back to Newcastle and then driving back into Scotland. So how is, you know, you'd have to put in place a very cumbersome you know, set of border controls and inefficiencies and it would take business away from Scottish airports if they did that and to actually no, no practical effect. I mean, I think once you go internationally on this rather than domestically, then the control issues of having a different policy either side of the, the Scottish English border is uh, is very expensive and I'm not sure it's terribly productive. Okay the fact the local elections take place before May the 17th yeah. might, might help the alignment I, su I suppose. Well, uh, what about foreign office advice Mark? The report suggests this will be aligned with um, the other recommendations of the task force report. 
Well, this is an absolutely crucial element that we've been calling for for, for weeks uh, that you know, foreign office advice is clearly separated from the um, sort of health control measures uh, that are outlined in the framework. Um, you know, foreign office advice is about the risk to an individual in a destination. So, of course, there may be COVID risks there in terms of the um, you know, prevalence of, of, of the uh, disease and the availability of healthcare facilities and so forth. But that is different to controlling uh, the risk profile coming back into the United Kingdom. And of course, last year, what we saw was a blanket foreign office advisory against all but essential travel, which effectively you didn't have to have any other measures. It just meant that people weren't going to be traveling in any case. Um, <clears throat> I think the minister uh, that we've spoken to is clear that there are, those are very different types of advice and, uh, and control, uh, and we must keep them that way. There will always be a need for foreign office advice, and there will be foreign office advice relating to COVID, but it must be used for the risk to the, to the passenger or to the customer in destination. Okay, and is that what you're expecting to see now? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, the, the reviews, we've dates we've talked about, but obviously the review of individual countries is going to be continual, and we can expect mm -hmm. the countries on the list to, to change week by week week if there's uh, changes in the incidence of variants and and so on um, the report says the joint biosecurity center will publish data and analysis to uh, help inform people but how detailed do you expect that to be because the government is not likely really to publish the thresholds at which it makes changes and and so on and it's also not likely to make clear um, whether for example it trusts the data of particular uh, governments or, or or not is it so so that's going that process is is going to remain opaque isn't it yeah, I think you're probably right here. I mean, they mention, you know, their confidence in the data as one of the criteria going into into the assessment, and um, you know, that's a very uh, sort of subjective uh, <laughs> thing to assess. I think um, I think the other issue they've got is that um, you know it's a balance of the different factors, so it'd be quite difficult to say, well, because you hit this threshold on on infection rates or vaccination rates, it is you know you're good to go, because they might say, well, actually, we've worried about this variant it seems to be cropping up in this part of the country. So I think um, what I would say is I think differently to last year, where we had really did have stop go every Thursday when a country's infection rate spiked and suddenly it was on you know the travel corridor was slammed shut is that the you know the, i expect the pace of change to be uh slower because you'll see you know variants growing they don't grow in quite the same rate as as overall infection rates and that there'll be uh through the green watch list sort of more uh, advanced warning of when a country might be moving towards uh an amber status um which will help uh Help, help with planning and help consumer confidence, I think, that they're not suddenly going to find themselves having left in a, go to a green country zone and find it's turned amber while they're there and they've got to quarantine when they come home. And, and the indication of a slower pace, is, is that something you take from the report or, or something that's been made clear to APTA in your dealings with the, the government? Well, I think it's been implied in, 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 in the way in which the, um, the green watch list has been developed, uh, but also the fact that it's a more complex set of criteria than uh, purely the infection rate and those other uh, factors. You know, the reliability of data doesn't change on a week by week basis. That's something that is is kind of built into the system. And similarly, with you know the, the evidence of variants. Um, so I think there are within that that sort of algorithm, if you like it, there are things that are moving at a longer pace than than the short term. So okay. I think we will have more evidence of, they need to give more evidence of why a country had moved from one to another than just uh, flipping the switch. Okay, the, the watch list is clearly going to be in, important. What are the implications of a country being on the green watch list, would you say? Do you expect, you know, um, consumers to want to cancel or rebook for a destination that isn't on the watch list and, and, and so on? Well, I think this partly depends on how this works in practice. I mean, if, if the watch list says this is on a review list and we'll pick it up at the next review in five weeks' time, then uh, 
then people will be able to plan according to that. If the watch list means actually be ready that this could change tomorrow, then people are going to feel very differently. And I don't think the government, to be fair, knows at the moment because it doesn't know the speed at which these variables are going to change. And um, I don't think they want to be, you know, they'd like to give as much um, confidence to customers and the industry as possible, but then they don't want to be accused of having said something and then having to change it at short notice if suddenly there's evidence that, that they need to, to move something to an amber category or potentially to a red category. So, um, yeah, I think they're trying to, to, to keep their options open um, and we'll see uh, as we get into this um, how quickly things can move off the green list, uh, if necessary, to the amber list. OK, that, that's an important point, isn't it, that the government probably doesn't really know yet, because everybody wants certainty and stability. And those are two things that uh, we're just not going to get in the circumstances. I think, as you said, you're absolutely right. I think um, certainty is great, but certainty that then changes is well, probably worse than not being certain in the first place. So I think um, caution is their watchword at the moment. You know, you know, when I talk to ministers, they are, you know, they want the safe restart of international travel and they want it done uh, as, as, as quick as possible, but they're cautious. And I don't think they want to give health prisoners to fortune or political prisoners to fortune by by being over um, confident about how quickly things will will change and how fixed they will be once they have changed so so the prospect for the industry is of need to remain highly flexible ready to rebook refund issue refund credit notes whatever what, whatever whatever it is because there are going to be changes and the government has said it will act swiftly yeah, I think you know, explicitly and implicitly in the government's in the task force statement is that you know the the restarting of international travel is going to be a gradual process through the summer. We want it to be as quick as possible. We want it to be a you know, proper summer season, but it's not going to be a, a May the seventeenth. Uh, you know, open sesame, everyone can travel, and I think um, you know, that leads us into the other area, which is our continued call for um, you know financial support for the sector because it's clear from the government. Uh, task force report that they see this as an unfolding process that um, you know the uh, you know the ability of the travel industry to, to trade fully is going to be hobbled and, and held back by domestic health concerns and that I completely understand that but then they need to kind of reflect that in the level of support that's available to help companies come through this. Okay the the, the government has steadfastly not given any sector specific support uh, anymore uh, up to now so I, I, I wonder why you uh, think that might still be a possibility but it has promised that uh, outbound travel will be included in the tourism recovery plan which we'll see in, in, in May to some extent are you hoping for something from that? Yeah, well, we you know we hope we hope for that, um, and as you say, the fact that we haven't had any uh, support forthcoming, I think. Uh, doesn't mean that it's not going to come or that it's, it's clearly um you know an uphill battle but i think uh you know as more sectors come back into business it will be evident that travel international travel isn't keeping up with those uh, and therefore it, rather than every sector saying we need financial support you'll find uh, you know particular sectors that have been particularly held back by government uh, policy and travel is one of those okay let's talk about a couple of things that are the uh, are welcome. Um, the government's no longer saying it's too early to book a summer holiday. The report says explicitly people are free to book holidays abroad in, in summer. That's that's welcome, isn't it? Very welcome. Yeah, I mean, the effect of the uh, not saying that previously was very dramatic on people's confidence to book. And you could see, you know, every time a, a minister was interviewed on television saying uh, people shouldn't book, you our members' bookings you know, dried up. So I think that that message to customers that you can book and that uh, because we, A, we see you will be able to travel. And, um, you know, I know from our members that there are very flexible um, booking conditions now, if that's not the case, uh, is critical. And, um, you know, they you know, said it for, for a long time, there is a lot of pent up demand. Uh, and I think um, we need to let people start start booking and anticipating going going on travel uh, holidays and visiting friends and relations again okay but there, there hasn't been m much of a pickup in bookings for early in the summer has there since the the task force report came out what bookings there are are generally for later in the year and 
and next year? Yeah, I, I would say that's true. I mean, it, it varies on you know, member to member, so it's hard to get an overall uh, picture of, of how quickly the market has, has responded to the task force announcement. Um, but if you look at it, and because there's no certainty at the moment about which countries are on green lists and which are on amber, then you can see that people will be leaning towards uh, booking later until they've got clarity around those details. Okay. And the extension guarantee for the Air Travel Trust Fund from the government, that's uh, welcome as well, I guess. Yeah, very. I mean, very welcome to the industry. I think, uh, you know, we did it uh, in, in advance of the Air Travel Trust Fund, recognising that... Um, you know, effectively April was going to be a, be a lost month. So, uh, you know, a deadline that ended at the end of March wouldn't help people, you know, get through that rebooking process. And, um, you know, we're glad the CAA has, has followed suit and, and adopted a similar time frame. Okay. So, uh, Mark, what sort of opening do you, do you expect to see? Do you expect to see some travel commence from May the 17th? And what sort of green list do you do you hope for at this stage what countries might be on it oh i can't predict that Ian. i, I you know I, I'd, I'd like the biggest green list possible because uh, as i say i think the amber list is is a pretty big barrier for people who uh, wanted to travel and for business travel in particular um but as to to which countries will be on it uh i don't know uh, obviously if our main you know the biggest destinations were there then that would be great for them and great for us um I do think travel will start after May the 17th. I think, um, you know, all the indications that um, the Prime Minister gave were that the, the checklist for, for the roadmap um, is, being, is being followed. You know, the vaccination rates have gone up, the infection rates have gone down, the R rates down, the pressure on hospitals has gone down. So from a... You know, from what he said about this is our initial roadmap, I don't see anything at the moment that means they would need to deviate from that. I think, you know, there are, um, you know, evidence of, of variants uh, of, of COVID um, overseas and clearly other European destination countries are having their own sort of third wave lockdowns, which is, um, which is an obstacle. But um, I think, uh, you know there's enough uh, hope and enough enough places that you can travel to that i really hope that people can travel after may the 17th okay let me ask the question in another way then my, my forecast would be that there may be a limited green list from may the 17th possibly only a handful of destinations certainly only maybe one or two that are the, among the most popular destinations but there could be a wider reopening uh, from July, uh, assuming things in the EU go fairly well and, and the government gets on with bilateral uh, negotiations with the US and things go reasonably well there. W would you think that's a realistic estimate or are you hoping for more than that? I think that, that, that is realistic. Uh, I hope for more, but I think that's realistic. So I both, you know, I think, um, you know, there, there's, there's clearly going to be a, a sense from the government point of view and from the systems point of view of uh, sort of learning as we go along with this, with the traffic light, how, you know, how countries get onto it, how quickly they come off it, how they move up it and so forth. And I think that will um, get refined as we get further into the summer. So that I hope by the time we get to July, August, there's a very solid system there um, that people understand is, is easy to use and that they can travel with. But you're right, on May the 18th, we'll be still be learning how, how all this is going to come together. So there probably will be fewer countries immediately accessible. OK, somebody fairly senior in the industry said to me uh, yesterday, uh, really, any travel before September is probably unrealistic and it's only going to be in the final quarter of the year that we'll see a that we will see a pickup. Do you think that's overly pessimistic? Yes, I do. I think, um, I think, uh, you know, the government is, is open the door to this. There are lots, I say, there are lots of um, constraints and, uh, and, and precautions, but that's because they anticipate people traveling, I think. Uh, and um, I think the appetite is such that uh, even with the PCR test at, at the green level, people will want to get away this summer. And, um, I think if we can work hard on the cost of that test and uh, people will think, OK, that's um, not welcome, but it's an affordable cost uh, against the, uh, the experience of being able to travel.
There, there seems to be a belief amongst some in the industry that the government has some sort of hostility to uh, outbound travel. Is that? Do you see any evidence of that? No, I don't think hostility. I think there's always we always have to work hard to persuade government and, and members of parliament that outbound travel is a really important contributor to the UK's economy. It's easy to say, well, actually, it'd be better if everyone took a staycation and didn't spend their money in, in, in Spain or Portugal or America. But the reality is that we generate a huge amount of GDP here through outbound travel, through all the services that, that send people overseas, through goods that people buy before they travel. And of course, it's trade, you know, that, uh, you know, where by our um, sort of spending money in, in overseas destinations, they have money to spend on UK goods. So I think all of those arguments say that this is a really important sector. You know, tourism, uh, you know, fills aeroplanes. You know, everyone, you know, everyone in government says that connectivity is, is important as we you know, strive to be a global hub. Well, you know, tourists you know, often fill the aeroplanes and make them viable in terms of economics. So I think getting uh, international travel up and running is important strategically as well as just in terms of its contribution to the UK economy. Um, so I don't think, you know, there's a sort of education sounds sounds patronising. I think they're, they're, we've got a constant job to remind politicians of that fact. And um, and then I think, you know, you'll see that uh, they'll, they'll take that on board. Okay. We're out of time. Mark, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Ian.